Thank you, Carly, and thank you, Tali, and that could not have been a better lead-in to our next speaker, Dr. Kate Rodriguez-Clark, who is with the Smithsonian Institution and uh, comes to us not from a background with corals, but a background with doing genetic management for lots of other species, both in large populations and small populations. She's worked on everything from the Houston toad to the Asian wild asses, and now is assisting us here in Florida um, with work on helping develop a genetic management plan for a crop row palmata in the Florida Keys, but hopefully that will then lead to further work for genetic management plans for a lot of the species we have in both in situ and ex situ propagation. Kate? Thank you, everyone. I guess, let's see. I don't have one of those fancy mics, so I'm going to stand here. Um, so you've made it to the end of the afternoon. I am the final speaker of the day. Um, if, you, if you only remember one thing, it, you can just remember everything that Carly said. So <laughs> she, did a, she did a great job setting me up for this, for this talk. And um, I am going to, uh, let's see, work out how to use this thing. I guess that takes us forward. And because uh, I knew I was going to be the last speaker of the day, I actually tried to cut down a lot on, um, on the detail. And there's only one equation. And I'm going to let you know that um, I, uh, there are three take-homes so, uh, that I hope you get go away with the, from this talk with. And one is that population management works. We have a lot of evidence showing that it works. It has three main elements. And uh, it involves setting goals. Uh, doing uh, demographic and genetic manipulations, uh, and then making decisions um, about what you're going to do. And then uh, the final point is that one size does not fit all. I think that this is a direct uh, response to a question that somebody just asked. So uh, the, what you recommend and do for one population in one particular place is not necessarily at all what you would recommend for another one. Um, and population management does work for uh, all different sizes of population, but it is most important for small populations. And this gets at another question that I think that we just had. So this population management is really most important when we are limited in some way, either with demographic resources or genetic resources. And the reason for that is that when we get to those small sizes, we have new processes that um, can come into the situation and can make extinction even more likely. So if we have a population that has been um, hit with outside you know, habitat loss, epidemics, pollution, other things, just the fact that it's a small population, many of you may remember from your basic evolution classes, um, can increase inbreeding, can uh, increase the probability of random, gene random genetic drift, which then uh, cause a loss of genetic variability, which then um, can reduce our survivorship and uh, reproduction, as well as our adaptability, which then can further cause problems and cause the, pro the population to spiral downward. And so population management is essentially trying to reduce, uh, trying to reverse this extinction vortex. And so it works. And here are some examples of just a few different vertebrate species that Smithsonian has collaborated on and has used population management in order to help recover in the wild. And um, to give you an example, the situations that we face in vertebrates are often a lot even more extreme than what you're facing in corals. So um, uh, black-footed ferrets, for example, have, we, uh, we're down to 18 um, founder individuals, 18 different individuals in the mid 80s. And because of population management and many other interventions, there are now thousands of these individuals in wild populations across, across the US. And these are just some of the other species. Um, and it is not just vertebrates. So um, my dear colleague, Paul Pierce Kelly at London Zoo, and his colleagues have used population management to, I think they're up to 14 different species and subspecies of parchula snail that they have saved using um, population management and reintroduction interventions. And um, it's not just these anecdotal cases of beautiful 
photos. Um, last year, we, uh, some colleagues and I did an analysis of about 350 different species that we followed over about 20 years. And um, what you can see is in populations where uh, management has been implemented, uh, there are cases where, uh, on average, we are seeing uh, stability in features that we would have expected to inevitably decline in the absence of management. So for uh, population size, growth rate, gene diversity, and the number of founders, all of which in the absence of management we'd expect to decline, we saw instead those, those big green bars, stability, or even an increase, right, those dark blue bars, which you would never expect to see in the absence of management. And on the other side, um, traits that you would expect without management to, um, to increase the, the distance from the target size that you want or the inbreeding, um, we did, again, we didn't see that. Um, and it is also not just in uh, these, these heavily managed uh, small populations that these principles are relevant. Um, there's a, just one example of a recent study in uh, oyster restoration where uh, they were able to show that um, increased genetic diversity in the hatchery, um, in the hatchery larvae used, uh, improves all kinds of um, uh, population size and success in the field. Um, so I think I'm going to skip over that. And so we're, maybe I've convinced you that it works. And uh, if I haven't, you're welcome to ask questions. But you might be asking, OK, so how do, how do we actually do this? Um, and what is it? And as I mentioned before, the population management is the process of making informed decisions about manipulating groupings of organisms and their interactions to influence these demographic features like the number of individuals or their sex or their, their size, um, as well as genetic features, so their level of relatedness or inbreeding, to achieve population goals. And this is really important because goals can be uh, a huge variety of things. They might be a number of individuals, but they could be everything to um, health or welfare. Now, how we actually do this in vertebrates when I speak to non-scientific audiences, I sort of summarize it and say, well, it's, it's matchmaking. We do match.com for animals. And, um, and I, 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 the problem is that's not a great analogy for corals, because coral life histories are so different from human life histories that you know they can redu reproduce asexually and sexually, and they have incompatibilities, and they have size-dependent um, classes instead of age-dependent fecundity and, and, and mortality and things like that. So I'm actually not going to, I don't have that much time either, so I'm not going to go through how we actually do this in vertebrates, but um, the principles are the same, and uh, many of them Carly just talked about in her previous talk. And I'm not going to, I don't have time to get into the decision-making part, which is really important, but I am going to talk a little bit about how we could get to goals in, co in corals and what kinds of demographic and genetic um, interventions we could consider. So this goals piece is really important. Um, and uh, smarter people than me have said, start with the end in mind. And I cannot overstress that. You will not get where you want to go if you don't know where you want to go. Um, and so some of the things that you need to get to goals are identifying what is your unit of concern, uh, what is a species. I know that there are, there are some uh, folks who are trying to manage corals and they don't even know what species they're dealing with, so that's an issue. Um, even once you can identify the species, knowing um, the populations that you're working with, and being able to identify what role would you like this population to play in conservation. Many populations can have multiple roles, and um, I'm just highlighting a couple of IUCN documents that are, are really useful at a very high level for the use of ex situ um, management in conservation, which uh, do a really nice job of across all animals and plants, and I think they even do fungi. Um, how to start thinking about what roles your populations are, are playing. And then developing a theory of change. So if, if your population is, is envisioned to, or your populations are envisioned to play this role in management, 
how exactly do you expect it to generate change in the future? And once you have that, then you can get to some specific targets. Um, I'm not really sure actually how much time I have at this point. So I think I'm going to actually skip. I was going to talk through. What's that? I have plenty of time. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, we have not done this with Acropora palmata yet in Florida. We're just starting to think about this. But here's an example of a theory of change given a particular role. So in Florida, um, people, uh, a sort of cartoon of what has happened is in the past, at the top of that curve, there was high abundance back in the, the 80s. And, and since then, there have been a series of stressors, for example, white white band disease, which have caused that population to crash. And today we're not seeing natural recovery, and instead what we're seeing is this ratcheting down of the population from continued um, hurricane strikes. And if we combine this with a sort of understanding of uh, the demography in this population, what, what has been explained to me, because I should also say, I am six months into learning about corals. And so um, by many, many people in this room, that uh, because we have these ne negative density dependent effects, these alley effects, the, the Acropora palmata in um, Florida has become so, so sparse that um, when gametes are released, there's a low probability of fertilization, which is why I have that gray circle slash through there. Even when you do get fertilization, you're not getting any settling because the substrate is not apt for it. When you do get some settling, you're not getting juvenile recruitment because they're getting out competed and they're getting predated and other things. And you also have limited uh, reproduction due to fragmentation because the fragments are, are um, falling away to areas that they're not able to, to take. And so the theory of change in um, this role of offsetting these ongoing threats, the theory of change is, well, we're gonna put fragments in because we can put them in the right location and then we know they'll grow up. And then maybe we won't be able to totally recover the population, but we will, and this is the dotted line, we will be able to bring it back to a low enough level and we'll be able to place them out in the right um, spatial organization so that when the other threats are taken care of, we will have this population in place that can um, fertilize uh, and spawn successfully and eventually lead to this, this settlement. So that was a long way of, exp of explaining sort of one species in one scenario, how we might get to this, this theory of change. And what this theory of change is useful for is it tells us what we're interested in in the end, right? How, how, what our, our end goal is in the wild, and why I often say in situ, and I know that this community sort of mixes up in situ and ex situ, but for me, in situ is in the wild. Um, and we know that we want this demographically functional population that can spawn, it can settle, it can grow up, it can fragment, all these things. And we also have this idea, right, from what uh, Carly just said, that we want it to be both adaptable and we want it to be high fitness. But there is, from I gather, that there's a lot of clarity on the demographic side in this community and there's somewhat less clarity on the genetic side, which is why those words are a little fuzzy. And so I'm gonna finish up by talking through actually what, from a management perspective, sharpening up those, um, those genetic things um, would look like. And they're gonna sound really similar to the things that, that Carly just mentioned. So we want our populations in the wild to be adaptable. What does this mean for ex situ, for our populations in captivity? Well, first of all, we need to know how many, how, how many unique founder um, genotypes we have. This is a, a, another piece of jargon from the population management world that we're not just concerned with unique genotypes, we're concerned with unique unrelated genotypes and we call them founders. And this work is ongoing in Palmata in Florida and so we're not quite sure yet. We think that there may be around 300 or fewer of these um, unrelated unique individuals. Um, or types, and um, so the first thing is to identify them all, sample them, and save them. And this is where gene banks can come in, and some colleagues that I was hoping to meet with this week are actually in, um, up north in Florida, 
working at this gene bank to try to make sure everything is safe. Um, and so the idea is to not only um, sample and save them, but to actually safeguard them. So another management intervention would be to identify them all and then distribute them. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Make sure that you have replicates in multiple places and multiple places that are not likely to all be hit by the same hurricane. Um, so another management inter intervention on this idea of getting an adaptable population in, um, in the wild is continuing what I sort of think of um, as, as evolutionary humility, which is a lot of what uh, Carly just talked about, that um, in our, in our closed populations, you might remember from your evolution classes that gene diversity can only be lost, or if you're doing some management, remain stable. On a, on a human time scale, mutation is not fast enough to generate new, new diversity. And um, here's the one equation, and it, it was developed way back in the 60s, and it, all it does is tells us that gene diversity, which is, um, uh, theoretically expected heterozygosity is equal to one minus this this symbol k bar, which is the average um, mean kinship of the population. What this expresses is the relatedness of each individual to itself and all other individuals in the population averaged across the entire population. And what this equation tells us is that if we want to maximize gene diversity, we have to minimize relatedness. And this is how we manage zoo populations. What we do is we keep track of a pedigree and we make a decision about who our broodstock is the next year, every year based on reanalyzing who's related to who because this changes according to the life history of the species. And um, now in corals, we don't have pedigrees and we don't, have, um, we don't even have the um, molecular genetic data for all of them. But um, we often we are starting to understand who our genetically unique individuals are, or we can also we can estimate that by um, individuals who have come from such distant locations in the wild that it's very unlikely that they would be related. And in managing a population, if you had some idea of who your um, founder lineages are, what you would want to do is make sure that all of those bars are equal in that graph. So you could see that the, the, the pink founder or the, the ones that are descended from that are a little bit overrepresented represented in that population. So that's not one that you would want to breed. Whereas the light blue ones and the black ones are relatively underrepresented and those are ones that, that you would want to breed in order to maximize diversity. Um, we're also not, con not just concerned about adaptation in the future, but high fitness right now. And um, one of the things that you do to ensure high fitness in the present is to avoid these, these twin problems of inbreeding depression and outbreeding depression. This is a decline in fitness traits from having parents that are either too closely related or too distantly related. This is why we don't generally um, marry our cousins or why it's even illegal in some places. And this is because um, inbreeding depression is something that is a particular risk in species that are historically large in outbreeding, right? Humans are a historically large outbreeding population. Corals at least the one that I'm familiar with seems to have been as well. And so it seems like a reasonable assumption that inbreeding depression could be a problem. Now, um, this, I, I have up here a great book that summarizes a lot of data across a huge number of plants and animals that show that in general, the risk of inbreeding depression is um, in general much greater than the risk of outbreeding depression. And so, um, and in the, in the zoo and aquarium world, we don't have time to actually do the experimental studies to understand um, the distribution of these, these two risks. And so we have sort of a rule of thumb, and that is that we assume that inbreeding depression is going to be a problem unless it's proven otherwise. And the, the way that we incorporate that into management is that we never cross uh, relatives, or we avoid it as much as possible, particularly siblings or parent-offspring pairs. Um, 
And uh, on the flip side, we only bother to manage for outbreeding depression if there's evidence for it. And so this gets a little bit into this question about uh, individuals, crossing individuals from Cuba to Florida, is that the, the burden of proof in a management perspective would be, well, show me it's gonna be a problem, and then, okay, I, 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 I'll look for another solution. But um, usually the risk, we assume that the risk of inbreeding depression is much higher. Um, but the wonderful thing is that with corals, you actually can experiment. And so I have been on the hunt for data on inbreeding and outbreeding depression. Um, and I have a line on a group of folks in Japan who I think might have some data on that. But if anyone else knows of more, please let me know. Um, of course, there are other, are, are other options for um, high, high fitness in the, the here and now, and uh, Carly's just talked a lot about that. We want corals that can with, withstand threat, threats, and so, um, of course, you can uh, try to do selection. Um, as Carly indicated, there could be a lot of problems with that, and one of the problems is that it risks your genetic diversity. Um, and as she just mentioned, another, another way that you can achieve that adaptation to local conditions is to bring in new variants that are um, performing well in similar environments from elsewhere. But that could be risky if there is outbreeding depression. But again, in corals, experiments are possible. Um, and so to just close up, what we would do in a management uh, scenario is to marry these, these genetic ideas with your particular um, demographic interventions. And so if in a particular case you've, you've determined that planting fragment, outplanting fragments is the appropriate intervention rather than disseminating larvae or, or some other um, demographic intervention, then, um, and you need to make sure that you get a certain amount of, of biomass in order to um, reduce these alley effects, you might start out planting with uh, well-adapted um, variants that you know that are gonna do well, but then go back and fill in with your greater diversity later. Um, and uh, to recover this function of uh, fertilization, uh, an intervention you, would, you could think of is looking at uh, what neighborhoods of, of corals can potentially cross with each other and then make sure that you are not placing siblings or parents and offspring within that neighborhood so that when there is spawning in the future, you don't risk inbreeding. So again, the take homes here are population management works. It has these three main elements. Decision making is a really important one that I didn't have time to get into. Um, but one size does not fit all. And I wanna just end thanking, um, well, thanking the organizers here for the opportunity to come here. I love learning about new organisms and corals are fascinating. Um, and particularly recognize Gina Ferry and Kevin Willis who were two other folks who do a lot of population management that I bounced, bounced ideas off of. Um, they work as adjuncts with me in the Population Management Center of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums and then funding from all these folks. So thanks. Thanks, Kate.